All right. First of all, thank you very much for being here. It's so nice to have, <laughs> have some people. Um, history of modern art. Now, this is for me was quite interesting. 65 years ago, okay, I did uh, History of Fine Arts 1 at Wits University, okay, 65 years ago. And at that stage, uh, it was most exciting for me because we went through from the very beginning. Sadly, we stopped in 1860. And 1860 was just before modern art. So tonight is, um, I feel like a, a student again because I went and studied the, the whole story of modern art. Okay? And uh, so tonight for me, it's, it's quite it's like it's nervous. Normally I talk about orthopedic stuff and so on, and I know all what I'm, uh, most of the time I know what I'm talking about. But in this situation, it actually is, is quite fascinating. Now, so essentially, what is modern art? Okay? There's actually no clear definition of what modern art is. It basically was art produced between uh, 1860 and 1970, so a period of about 110 years. Uh, so this is now um, a, a very interesting time. Recently I went to a talk, uh, or a BBC show that David Hall Green had organized here, okay, where we looked at um, one painting, which we'll talk about that painting, for an hour. So I'm hoping to cover in about a half an hour, 110 years. So it'll be quite an interesting situation. All right. Now, essentially, modern art was preceded by academic art. Uh, now, this becomes very important. And then it was followed by contemporary art. Contemporary art means the artists are all still alive. Okay. Some of them have died, and they become what they call now postmodern art. Okay. So that, that was essentially the situation. Now, if we start looking at the comparisons, okay, um, this on the left hand side, you, sorry about that, you have Sargent's Girls, okay? Uh, this is the uh, um, classical period before uh, uh, modern art. On the right hand side, you have Mark Rothko's uh, painting, all right? Now, his paintings, the one painting I'll show you just now, sold for 55 million pounds, uh, uh, um, dollars, not pounds, 55 million dollars. Okay, for the for painting that looked very similar, they're actually not quite as smart as that one. Okay, so um, this was, a, for me, was quite fascinating. If we start looking now on the left-hand side, we've got Botticelli's uh, The Birth of Venus. Okay, that's a beautiful uh, a bit of art. On the right-hand side, we've got Jackson Pollock's art. Okay, um, Jackson Pollock is uh, an abstract expressionist, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So this is the comparison, you know, what exactly has happened? Even I got involved in this sort of thing. Uh, here we've got on the left-hand side, uh, again, a very typical religious painting. And on the right-hand side, uh, this is Dulaunay. And they were um, um, painters who painted circles, etc., etc., as you can see there. Okay, and uh, so-called Orphism. Okay. Here we've got on the left-hand side, again, Mo the famous Mona Lisa. On the right-hand side, we've got Picasso's The Crying Woman. So things just really changed. And it's uh, hard to accept that these, we had, both of them are in many ways are beautiful. But it's just interesting to compare. And then I even had a go here as well. On the left-hand side is Peter Tullis, our previous president, okay, which I painted a while ago. On the right-hand side is my painting called The Sea. All right, so <laughs> uh, we all have a go at this. And, People did change in terms of their genre as, as time went on. So what the hell happened? What changes? Why did these changes take place? What uh, stopped these people from going on? So we first got to look at academic art. Academic art essentially was based on Greek and Roman art. So it's the so-called cl classical art. The important thing about academic art, it had to reflect the moral forces of each painting. You know, they were it was very important. Painting techniques were strictly regulated. They were, uh, their layout, color scheme, finish, everything had to be. No visible brush strokes were allowed. Okay, they just didn't do it. And they discouraged experimentation. And the important thing about it, to get into the salons, this required uh, a, a lot of um, involvement with the academic people because they wouldn't allow them to, to enter the salons uh, or uh, exhibit the salons because of the fact that they were experimenting, the, the new people. So the academic art, they had very specific rules. What they also had was the hierarchy of the genres. Now, the hierarchy of the genres means 
the certain paintings were allowed to be exhibited, and particularly if they were large. The history paintings, portraits, and the so-called genre paintings. Genre paintings were paintings of everyday life. Landscapes and still life were regarded as taboo. They, you could sell them to your friends, but you couldn't sell them uh, anywhere else. So this was one of the uh, um, important things that took place. Now the history patients, uh, paintings were largely of a religious nature, okay, and some war type uh, situations. The reason being, the church was the main buyer. The Roman Catholic Church at that stage was all powerful in these sort of things. And these are so they usually were large paintings. Here we can see um, the, the famous uh, the, the French uh, Revolution, and we, this is uh, um, uh, Delacroix, okay, a beautiful painting, huge, and absolutely a huge painting. So the genre paintings, as I said, these were paintings of everyday scenes. This is Jean Fabier, the milkmaid. So this was a, a very nice scene and was accepted by the, uh, the people in, in charge, okay, uh, in terms of being allowed to be exhibited in the galleries. Then, what happened? Modern art came about. What was modern art all about? The artists were basically fed up, okay, uh, with the strict academic school. Originally, when I was thinking, why did they have modern art? I thought it was to do with photography. I thought maybe photography had a f uh, was a factor here because now they didn't have to have a, a portrait painted because they could just take a picture. But in actual fact, that w wasn't the case. It was the strict academic school which upset these guys. So the traditions of the past, they abandoned them uh, in the favor of experimentation. Experimentation was everything. Innovation, freedom. It had to be, they had, and there were many different art movements okay, in this period of 110 years. If one look at, looks at art, there are different aspects of art. And so... Um, you have line, shape, space, value, form, texture, color. David Orr Green knows all about those sort of things. The, so all of these could be changed, could be experimented on, and eventually that's exactly what they did. So they, you could change the line, the shape, the space, etc., etc., okay, to make it different. So they developed, modern art developed new themes, okay, new materials, okay, the methods had changed. They started using color far more expressively than before. And as far as they were concerned, art really mattered. It, for them, it had real, real value. And this is the painting that I was talking about earlier on. This is Edouard Monet, okay, and this, is the, this particular painting is called Déjeuner uh, sur l'air, okay, which is uh, lunch on the, on the grass. And this was the start... It has a subtitle, if I may interrupt. What's that? It's called No Picnic is Complete Without a Naked Lady. <laughs> well, good for you. Okay, so, so Edward Bonnet painted this painting. Now, this painting was regarded as being diabolical by these people because it showed two men clothed with a naked woman and a semi-naked woman in the background. So for the, for the, this was regarded as absolutely terrible, terrible. Not only was it a naked woman, but she was looking directly Okay, at the, the, the audience uh, that, that was being, that, uh, or the man who was painting her. And this, I say, was regarded as being a, a, a tragedy. Okay, it was really very, very bad. And say, we had a, this talk which lasted an hour, okay, um, on this particular, uh, uh, particular thing. And this was the beginning of, that's Edward, I was, got pictures of these guys just to show you what they looked like, because I never knew what, what any of them looked like. And that was Edward Monet. This was the beginning of Impressionism. Impressionism started because this was the breakaway. This was the, the original uh, uh, breakaway. But where did the name come from? There was an art critic, Louis Leroux, okay, who saw a painting by Claude Monet called The Impression Sunrise, or uh, Soleil, uh, um, uh, what's sunrise? Soleil, it's, sorry, I've got to think of the name. Uh, whatever, okay, The Impression Sunrise. And he wrote that this painting was just an impression, and the name stuck. There's the painting. You can see now the, the, the sunrise. Okay, it's, it's just it is an impression uh, as far as that was concerned. All right, and um, this was the start of impressionism. This started 1870s to the 1880s. There were brilliant artists like Manet, Monet, Cezanne, Degas, Van Gogh. Okay, they were all involved in this. Non naturalist uh, natural colors were basically used in, in terms of these, these paintings. So it was really a very exciting time because they were now ex uh, um, experimenting on all sorts of things. They started using, for the first time, you could see visible brush strokes. They were small, thin, but they were visible. Open compositions. 
They have an accurate depiction of light. Okay. And ordinary subject matter. So they were looking at uh, just ordinary things. They weren't looking at the portraits that were done before were of, of um, queens and kings, etc., famous people. This was just ordinary subject matter. Now, the trouble with, with them is that the salons were controlled by the academics. And therefore, these guys were not allowed okay, to uh, exhibit in these, in these salons. And in 1863, Napoleon III, he opened the Salon des Refusés, the salon for the people where the paintings were refused. Okay? And they allowed them to exhibit their work uh, there. Okay? Interestingly enough, there were very few historical paintings which were so popular okay, with the academic school, there were very few historic paintings uh, painted at that stage. Again, a typical uh, um, Impressionist painting. So we had this wide variety of Impressionists. This is also Monet. Okay, now, this is an interesting picture. This is Claude Monet okay, um, exhibiting some of his paintings. What's interesting about this is that, of course, there was, at that stage, there was no black and white photography. There was only black and white photography. There was no color photography. So this is a recent thing. They've taken this picture, okay, this black and white, and they've done it all like it's an ordinary picture, which I think is quite, quite unique because you can see you know, the, shine of, the shine of his shoes, the paintings are all very, very uh, um, interesting as well. And this was his world. Now, Givenet, okay, is where he lived, and we've been fortunate enough to go to Givenet to his where he lived and to see the, the water lilies and so on because this is what he loved to paint and it was for us it was very very interesting. Paul Cézanne. Paul Cézanne is regarded by many as the father of Impressionism. Okay, He was uh, um, uh, uh, an interesting painter. Here again we can just see the difference <coughs> from the academic school. Okay, It's all different. This is the bathers as this was called. Okay, a very, very different situation. Sorry. What have I done? Okay. Okay, Renoir. This is a self-portrait. I'm trying to show as many of these people what they look like. This is a self-portrait of uh, Pierre-Auguste de Renoir. Okay, and his paintings now. Now, this would never, this was an everyday scene, okay, would never have been accepted by the academics because it was too casual, okay, they weren't important people, they were just ordinary people um, being involved. Now, Degas, this is again a self-portrait of uh, Edgar Degas, okay, what's interesting about him is that he loved painting ballet dancers. So he painted ballet dancers, many, 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 many beautiful paintings, but would never have been accepted, okay, by the academic school. So this was the change that was taking place. Vincent van Gogh, this was a, also a self-portrait, right? and again you can see he's gone off the, the normal, the painting of, a, of, of himself as it would have been done before, a very accurate painting, he's got different colours in the face, he's got all kinds of things like that, okay, and that's what he was of. Now he was an Impressionist, but with time, as time went on, he became an Expressionist, okay, and his Starry Starry Night, Okay, this, this particular painting here is a classical expressionist painting. We'll c come into that uh, now, now, now. Okay, so he became an expressionist painter as well. After the, the, the development of uh, uh, the impressionists, we have the Fauvists. Okay, now the Fauvists were a very uh, interesting group because there was an art critic, Louis Vossel, okay, who entered Gallery 7 in Paris in 1905, in the middle of the room was this beautiful Donatella sculpture surrounded by these Fauvist paintings. And he wrote, ah, a Donatella among the wild beasts, because in French, Fauve is a wild beast. And they called them the Fauve, and the name struck, uh, stuck. So they became the, uh, the, the Fauvists. And you can see the difference, all right? Who were the famous ones? This took place ba basically 1905 to 1907. Henri Matisse, okay, and Henri de Rhin, okay, these were the people that were the, the main ones involved. Uh, and I'll, everyone, I've just used some of the main people. They painted vivid, garish, non-naturalist colors, okay, but they illustrated the independent power of color. Color became an important thing, and they not only would uh, they didn't have timid brushwork like the uh, Impressionists, but it was fierce brushwork. They really got fierce. Now here we see Henri Matisse, okay, on the left, and this is one of his paintings, all right, and one can immediately see it's also, it's, it's, uh, it's a rougher, He's, the paintings, the, the background, it's, you can see the brush strokes 
clearly in, on, on the painting. So he, they didn't really care. They were going against the establishment very much so. Okay, Henri Durand, I think this is a self-portrait. He was quite fat, but he made himself quite thin. Okay, but you can see now the, the, the color scheme, etc., etc. Very different. But look at the landscapes. The landscapes became an important thing. Here we can see the landscape painting, okay, um, essentially um, colorful as can, all can be. Look at this one. It's amazing. I mean, really, it's a really amazing to see colors like that. So they really went into, the four of us really went into for, for colors. And obviously not natural in terms of the whole thing. Even this, I think, I love this painting in actual fact. Okay, this was now this, the same sort of thing. Just look at the, the, the sky, look at the background. Okay, the cat, yellow cat. It's just you know, absolutely fascinating because of, of the use of color. So the four of us played an important role for a while. Then along came the Cubists. Okay, now the cub Cubism was a very interesting um, um, style in terms because they completely changed everything. Essentially, they started off in 1908 and they were at their max peak in 1914. But of course, Cubism went on for a long time. What was different about Cubism is that the, the com they had a compositional system of flat, splintered planes. So it was no longer depth perception, it was all flat uh, planes and they sort of splintered them all up. This was developed by Pablo Picasso and Georges Bach. Okay? The whole idea, they, sh they offered an alternative view to the normal perspective. That's essentially what they did. And here we can see Georges Braque, okay, and this is the violin, okay, the picture on the right. Now you've got to try and find a violin there, okay, it's not, not easy. I've, I've tried to look in a few places, it could be violins, but this is his painting of the violin. <coughs> Flat, as you can see, just broken up, okay, um, in many ways. This is his painting of the guitar player. All right. Again, the same sort of thing. Very flat. There's no depth perception whatsoever, in, in the, as far as this is concerned. All right. But it's still, it's interesting. It's, it's uh, quite fascinating. Then Pablo Picasso. I mean, this was an amazing man. And again, to show you the changes, how they, they changed, they started. Okay, Pablo Picasso, a, a picture of him on the left. Then when he was 15 years of age, that picture on the right. Now that he painted, it was a self-portrait, okay, which he painted. And you can see he was a good artist. And then he started developing a, a flatter plane, all right, as say, in terms of cubism. And you can see his plane when he was 25 years of age, again a self-portrait. And then the final one, of course, he was 89 years old when he painted that self-portrait of himself. So things had really changed. And the interesting thing, we were able to, uh, in London, we saw an exhibition um, of Pablo Picasso and Henri Matisse together, okay, and it was interesting to see how they both developed in the same way. They both became more and more abstract from their flat planes, more and more abstract uh, uh, as, as time went on. This is now Pablo Picasso as a young man, him painting himself. So before 1904, the so-called blue period, he painted beautifully, okay? It was very accurate, etc., etc. And then you see him starting to change. Painting on the left, you can see it's still uh, it's blue, it's again in his blue period, and on the right, it's now changing. It's now getting difference in, in colors. And then we start seeing that now he's really changing, going overboard in terms of um, his uh, whole idea of uh, um, cubism. Okay? And it's a, but it's still it's a magnificent painting if, if one has a look at it. Okay? And then, of course, as I said, the crying woman. This is very flat plane, but a beautiful painting. Uh, Jean Gris the, painted this, I, this particular, I like this particular painting, as I say, it's, it's supposed to be, uh, it's, well, it is pretty flat, okay, in terms of it, and segmented, but it's a beautiful painting. So that was the, the at that stage, okay, we had the, this group. Then, and this was now, France had been involved uh, um, for most of, the, of this. Then we had the Expressionism, okay, the Expressionists. The Expressionists were very, very interesting because they were basically from Germany. There were expressionists all over the place, but they were from Germany. Okay? And their aim was to present the world solely from a subjective perspective. They distorted it radically in order to evoke moods and ideas. That was the whole idea. You were expressing your, themselves to get a, a reaction from people. So people would react. And I'll never forget, we went to the Mecht Foundation uh, in St. Paul de Vence a few years ago. And we were there, there was an English lady there, and there was a sculpture there. It was really a grotesque sculpture. And 
the attitude that she had, and uh, she looked at this thing and she said, my God, it'll give me nightmares. Okay, and this is exactly, it it, you had a reaction, okay? Uh, it was ordered, it was radically changed to uh, evoke moods and ideas. They tried to convey emotion and meaning rather than reality. Now, the colors were vivid and as also sometimes shocking. Okay, interesting thing is that although this was the German school, Edvard Munch, who was a Frenchman, uh, was a, a Finnish guy. Norwegian. And, uh, eh? Norwegian. Norwegian. Norwegian, yeah. And the, the sorry, yeah, Norwegian. And the, the, the scream is one of his, and he's regarded as one of the origins of, uh, originators of Expressionism as such. Basically, there were two schools okay, of Expressionism in Germany. Die Brücke, the bridge, which was Berlin and Dresden, and that was Ernst Kirchner, and then the Blaue Reiter, the Blue Riders, were Munich and Murnau. Now, we have the two very good friends, Wolfgang Vorringer in Munich and Wolfgang Bär in Murnau, so we've spent a lot of time with the, with the Blue Riders. They had an interesting guy, Vasily Kandinsky, was one of the guys who was a Russian who came to uh, um, Murnau, and they, he lived in Murnau for, for a few years. Okay. With him there was Franz Marc and Gabriela Munter, who were really the other uh, parts of this expressionist group. Now this is uh, the Berlin group, this was Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, okay. on the left a photograph, on the right a self-portrait. Interesting to see how things had changed. It was no longer was he accurately trying to depict himself. Okay, he had pink around his eyes. He had all sorts of different colours. It was it was, became uh, quite a fascinating scene. This is one of his uh, paintings. Okay, um, say for me a rather beautiful in many ways. Vasily Kandinsky, as I say, started in Russia, and he, in actual fact, became uh, to many people became the uh, father of abstract art. Okay, this is when he was still in Myrna, painting a scene in Myrna, okay, and with the bright colors, you can see the beautiful colors, etc., okay, that he, that he painted. This is Vasily Kandinsky's self-portrait on the left. The painting on the right is to show you how abstract he had become. Okay, this is called, the, the name of this painting is called The White Dot. You can see the white dot on the top right hand corner, That's the, the, and it was called the white dot. So these guys were changing all the time, okay, in terms of what they saw and what they thought. Franz Marc, okay, um, was one of his uh, self-portraits, and there was Franz Marc's, uh, the horses, the blue horses, as uh, I think it's well known to everybody, okay, the blue horses. And then, of course, the other one is Gabriela Munter, and you can see her art style as well. Bright colors, okay, in many ways beautiful. And this is a self-portrait of Gabriela Munter. You can see that, again, lots of color, light, um, and in many ways beautiful. Then we have Dadaism. Okay, the Dada group were an interesting group. Uh, now, as I said, we went from France to Germany. These guys were Swiss. Okay? And this Swiss situation, they, they were basically an anti-art establishment. They became very negative. They, this is at the time of uh, the uh, um, First World War, Okay, it was launched in Zurich in Switzerland in 1916. They were uh, anarchists uh, in, uh, in terms of what they were all about. They were in, in totally against the involvement of the World War I. Sorry, I've just got World I. But they, in World War I, okay, they were totally against this, and they really um, felt very strongly about things, and they were, in many ways, uh, um, difficult people. In Germany, in German, Dada means a sign of foolish naivety, nonsensical. Okay. The whole idea was, its purpose was to ridicule the meaninglessness of the modern world. Peak between 1916 and 1922. And Marcel Duchamp was, was the guy that was most involved. Okay, now he's, he's an interesting character in himself. This is a classical Dadaism, just a conglomeration of all kinds of things, just all put together okay, um, to show. This is Marcel Duchamp, as I say, an, an interesting character uh, in himself. He didn't paint much. But here we got, now this is his, one of his paintings of the Mona Lisa with a little beard and moustache. This was, they were just, they didn't care a damn. That's what were they were all about. They really didn't care a damn. Now this is, for me, this is an interesting picture because this is one of his fa famous ones, the new descending the stairs. And I looked at this initially and I thought, yeah, that's interesting, but what's it all about? Now, th so they took a photograph of a nude walking downstairs, repetitive photographs, and you can see the similarity. So he util utilized photography 
for the painting. So to make this painting, he utilized photography because they, it's a very similar situation. Okay, and so um, that was his new descending. But he also got involved in what they called the ready maids. Now the ready maids were things like this. This is a man's urinal, okay, on the left hand side. A man's urinal, and on the right hand side, he took a chair and he put a bicycle uh, um, wheel on it and he fixed it like this, and there he is sitting there. This is what he had as ready made. So uh, it's just weird. So he was more into sculpture, okay, uh, than anything else. Also, trash art, where they just took bits and pieces of everything and they made an art form out of it. So they were really quite interesting. So th that was now, okay, if we can start looking around, we've had France, we've gone to Germany, we've gone to uh, Switzerland, and now the futurists, okay, they were from Italy. Now, this was founded in Milan in 1909, okay, and it was continued after World War, World War I by the poet Marinetti. Now, Marinetti was an interesting character in himself, okay, because he was a poet, because it wasn't just the art, it was also literature, etc., etc. One of the, the famous guys at that stage was Umberto Faccioni, okay. Now, the whole idea of these paintings in Futurism, to, they emphasize speed, the dyn dynam dynamism, okay, energy, and the power of the machine. This was all, but also it was vitality, the change in, uh, and restlessness in modern life. Interestingly enough, they glorified war and the growth of fascism. So this was an important part going on to the, the Second World War. This was uh, Umberto Baccioni, okay? um, again, interesting looking character. Here we can see the art. This is called The Cyclist. All right? This is one of his, uh, his paintings, The Cyclist. And there are many more. This is, the, uh, again, the racing car. You can see that the whole idea is uh, um, speed, uh, everything like that, all uh, motors of, of all kinds. Another one of theirs, you see, very action stuff, lots of action. You can just look at this, this painting and you can see action, okay? And this is the train coming into the station. A amazing picture, a absolutely amazing, okay? How they could develop and think about these. I mean, I could never ever do that in my life because it's just so much. This is the swallows, the swallows arriving, okay? And you can just see here they come the swallows and just different, but, but in many ways magnificent. Okay, even their portraits. There was action in the portrait. It wasn't just a guy sitting there. Uh, there was action uh, taking place. So that was a, another group. And then you had surrealism. Okay, now this was, we all know about this and, uh, uh, and because it's been quite interesting for all of us, okay. This was also an artistic and literary movement. It was started by Henri Breton. He was a poet in Paris in 1924. He started this. Previous movements had been suppressed, uh, had suppressed the qualities of irrational, unconscious mind. Uh, so the, he was working on sur surrealism, the irrational unconscious mind, okay, and it was characterized by dreamlike visuals using symbolism, just absolutely different uh, uh, as far as that was concerned, okay. It was profoundly influenced by Sigmund Freud, okay, and he had wrote a book, The Interpretation of Dreams. So the whole idea with sur surrealism was to try and express the unconscious mind, okay, and this it stemmed from the imagination, everything that he thought. All, everything had a dreamlike uh, quality. It, it, realism, it took realism and twisted it and distorted it. And of course the famous guy was Salvador Dali. There's Salvador Dali on the left. And you can just see, if you look at this, this is a nightmare. I mean, the, 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 in terms of a dream, that's just the most terrible nightmare. But a lot of these things, this is the artist, okay? You can just see everything is different. They've just done whatever they like, to get a reaction from, from the people. That's what they were looking at, to try and get a reaction from the people. Also, one of the famous ones, okay, the watch, right? And uh, you just see, it's, everything was absolutely different. So th this was, again, an, a school going in another direction, okay, but quite fascinating. Look at this, the, the dream here. Here's a man with a, with a cross trying to prevent this with naked women and so on, and horses with long legs, all variety of dreamy type situations. Again, the same sort of thing, really warlike, this in terms, in terms of that sort of thing, all right? Everything very different, very different uh, uh, as far as that was concerned. Then we started having abstract expressionism. What happened at this stage is that the European schools uh, um, were no longer as important. The, the whole group went to the United States. But abstract expressionism began, in actual fact, um, in England, right? 
It was developed, later developed by the American painters Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, uh, and Willem de Kooning okay, in the 1940s and the 1950s. And they had two types. They had action painting and color field painting. Okay. The aim to sh uh, was to show that reality is subjective. They were allowed to experiment with form, color. Okay, they were given free reign to the imagination, so they could do anything that they, that, that they really liked. So this was a combination of abstract painting. This means depict, depicting forms not from the visible world. And of course, there were many different painting styles because abstract painting wasn't with abstract painting had occurred before the expressive, uh, uh, expressive painting at the same time. Expressionist painting expresses the inclination towards the distortion of reality for emotional effect. Again, they want to have a reaction from people. Okay? And this is Jackson Pollock painting. All right? now, his canvas was on the floor and he threw paint at it, dribbled it, he did all kinds of things. So he was now, this is one of his paintings, he was looking at blobs of paint, squiggles, lines, uh, all kinds of things to get a reaction, a feeling. Okay? It's just most interesting but very, very different if we think about it. Another one of his paintings, uh, just absolutely different. So the, these were action paintings. There was, there was movement, there was action as far as it was concerned. Another one, I mean, just amazing. It looks like uh, a view from the from the sky of a, of a city, okay? But that's the sort of thing that he that he he painted. Mark Rothko, also an American, and he painted squares. He became a square painter, all right, and he had a lot of squares that he that he painted. Uh, and that was actually quite an interesting scenario. Here are the, the typical situation that he painted. This particular one sold, as I said, for $55 million. Okay, that's what it sold for. But this wasn't the most expensive painting, but $55 million for that. I mean, I think we could have a go at one of these, these paintings. But that's what it sold for. The interesting thing is, uh, I was looking at this, Leonardo, one of Leonardo's paintings sold for... $550 million. That was the most expensive painting to date. But these guys were still, okay, were still doing very well. But they estimate that the Mona Lisa, in 1960, the Mona Lisa was uh, valued at $100,000. Okay? And, and today's $100 million. Sorry, not $100,000. $100 million. And today it would have come out, if, they, if it was sold, to be about $860 million. That would be the, the value of, that, of that, that particular painting. So we see this, this sort of thing. Now, I so said, orphism was, all, again, instead of squiggles and so on, you had circles. So orphism was uh, Robert and Sonia Delaney. Now, they were French, okay? Also, they used strong colors, geometric shapes, but especially circles. They loved to do circles. And here's Robert and Sonia Delaney. Delaney, okay? That was um, quite fascinating. The next group was pop art. Now, pop art, again, was it, this had all moved to America, all right? And the thing about pop art, it challenged the traditions of fine art. They had simple, bold images of everyday items, celebrities, and animals. That was basically, it was all low-cost, mass-produced, and aimed at the youth. Classical American stuff, okay? Really, uh, very simple from that point of view. Okay, it was felt that it was a reaction to the seriousness of abstract expressionism. I didn't think abstract exp expressionism was particularly serious. Okay. This began in the United Kingdom in the 1950s, and it was meant to be fun. Okay. It was strong in the USA with our Andy Worrell, and Andy Worrell became a famous guy. On the, on the left-hand side is Andy Worrell. Okay. On the right-hand side, you know who. Okay. He also started painting, for example, this uh, Campbell's condensed clam chowder soup tin. This was one of the paintings, and he had some, a lot of different uh, tins that he painted in, in, this, in the same manner. Very accurate painting, but this qu quite fa fancy, very different. Okay, again, Marilyn Monroe, and again, another uh, person that we know very well, Michael John, uh, Jackson. Okay, this was the classical pop art, simple stuff for the masses. And this was a, a lion and a paint by numbers. You could buy this lion. And they would tell you how where to paint in a paint by number situation. Okay, this was classically the sort of simple stuff that they, they produced. It was really very very simple. And this was coming to the end of uh, the um, our particular situation now, where we have uh, um, the, the, from this came contemporary art from modern art. This was really the, the the end of the modern modern art era. So let's in summary 
Modern art resulted as a revolt against the strict control of the academic art. This is, the pundits feel that this was the case. And of course, experimentation became the name of the game. So all we saw now of playing, making lines differently in, in any way that we could, uh, that they could, this made it more and more exciting in terms of the, the art. And of course, very, very much more expensive. So contemporary art, that followed modern art, subject for another talk. Thanks very much. Any questions? I just wanted to add something. You were talking about that uh, Le Déjeuner yeah. sur l'herbe, which we featured here at U3A. Sur and, and everybody was speculating about the background to this painting. Why are there the two fully clothed men who look like real Parisian dandies and this naked lady sitting on her pile of clothes? What, what's the story behind it? And we came to the conclusion that she is an artist's model used to posing for both of them being artists and they decide on her birthday to give her a party. <laughs> so they invite her to come on a picnic sur l'herbe on the grass in the, in the woods and she said, what shall I wear? And they said, just come in your working clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Thank you so well much. Done, Thank you. Well done, Clive. Well done.